أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم So this is a course in Advanced Microeconomics 1 for the first year MPhil and PhD students So, before we start the course, we need to understand why we are studying. And uh, I don't know why you are here, but I can explain to you why I am here. So, that because the intention of a deed determines the value of the deed. So, if you're sitting here, there's some purpose for you sit, to sit here. I'm also sitting here, there's some purpose. And that purpose, it's very important to understand what that purpose is and why why we are here because what will happen de is determined by the intentions so my intentions are actually very complicated and there are many intentions of which some of them I will explain here but basically what I would like to teach you is that what is knowledge is very different from what you have been taught that is there is something called knowledge. What you have been taught is not that thing which is called knowledge. You have been deceived into thinking that learning 2 plus 2 equals 4 is knowledge. It is not knowledge, it is technique. Knowledge is something which changes your life, which helps you understand the world around you, which helps um, you change yourself, helps you understand who you are, why you are here what you should be doing. This, this is knowledge. So, once you understand what knowledge is, then there is an issue of how we learn knowledge. That's also very different from what you have been taught. You don't learn knowledge by taking notes and paper books. Uh, then, once this <coughs> idea of knowledge is present, then uh, the student has to have certain etiquette, adab, and the teacher also has to follow certain principles. And so these concepts, again, you have never been introduced to you because you have not been taught what knowledge is. So then the question is, what should we learn? What, what are the important things that we need to learn? And how we should learn them? So the question is, why is it necessary to start from ABC? This is something that if the student comes in first grade, then this is what he should be learning. Now you are in advanced education, doing the last degree. So we shouldn't be starting at what is knowledge and how you should learn and how to teach. This is something that you should have had a long experience in. But the fact is that the modern systems of education to which you have been, through which you have been, have become deeply corrupt. It's not that they are always like this. It is a process that has taken place. Even in early 20th century, educational systems were much better than they are today. And <coughs> in universities all over the world, we'll pick up the catalog of Harvard, for example. It says that our goal is to build character, is it is to teach people how to be better human beings. It is to teach people their responsibilities towards society, towards uh, family, towards the country and so on. But if you take, take a current Harvard catalog, you will not find any of this. So the what the system of education itself has changed, instead of teaching people how to be better human beings, it teaches people how to do jobs and how to earn money. Now this is only one half of the part of knowledge. Okay, you earn money, but <coughs> you become part of a system in which somebody, basically the students are being shaped as tools for use in a machinery, and if they fit their places, then they will earn a lot of money to the capitalists, and they will take some share of this for themselves, a small share for themselves. When the banks, uh, they uh, take uh, money from the depositors, they pay them 5%, and then they earn 20% or 30% or 40%. So <coughs> with a little bit of 
uh, reward you can get people to give you millions of rupees and then you can make a lot more money than they can <coughs> you, you must have heard of piketty a very famous author because he wrote this book about how inequality is increasing wa alaikum assalam so why has inequality been increasing well the basic analysis the book is very fat is that the rich people earn a higher return on their money than the poor people the poor people earn nothing or 2% or 3% the rich people earn 20% or more so obviously the gap between the rich and poor will keep increasing so the knowledge that you are being given is is actually harmful knowledge that is it is trying to take out aapka kya naam hai mohammed ibrahim he uh, this knowledge doesn't want to address mohammed ibrahim it wants to create a generic mr x and all of the people should be the same if mohammed ibrahim has any particular specific characteristics we want to rub them out because they will not fit into the cog so uh this is the wrong type of knowledge it, it destroys people it destroys personalities we don't want personalities we want people who are interchangeable parts in a machine so there is a dua allahumma anfa'ni bima 'allamtani wa 'allimni ma yanfa'ni so this uh, dua says that we are asked to useful knowledge so now this is a new concept which doesn't exist in western education what is useful knowledge according to the west all knowledge is useful there is no such thing as useless knowledge but the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said allah man yauzu bika min al-ilm la yanfa wa min qalb la yakhsha wa min nafs la tashba wa min du'a la yasma so he sought protection of allah from knowledge which does not bring benefit so useless knowledge is actually harmful now there is no such concept in 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 the west uh, for a reason which we will we might discuss so then once we understand that some types of knowledge are good sometimes are bad and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam sought protection from harmful knowledge then we have to ask the teacher has to ask am i giving students useful knowledge or am i giving them harmful knowledge and students have to ask am i acquiring knowledge which is useful because if it's harmful knowledge then i should stay away from it i should not get it if it's useless the useful then i should get it now how do we know actually in the west the, as i said the distinction does not exist according to them all knowledge is useful knowledge why because of this first thing that the intention the purpose of life has been lost bertrand russell famous philosopher atheist philosopher he said that this universe was created by an accident everything came into being by an accident regardless of what you do whether you are a hero or a coward whether you try very hard and struggle or you don't it will all it makes no difference there is nobody who is watching nobody who cares and there is no purpose to life it will all end in a accident so once you have this view then the useful means useful in achieving some goal so if there is a purpose to life then knowledge is useful if it helps you achieve that purpose knowledge is harmful if it hurts you from achieving that purpose. but if there is no goal then everything is the same there is this uh, story alice in the wonderland by lewis carroll in which alice comes to a fork in the road and there is a cat sitting on the tree and so that is which which side should i take which direction should i go into the right side or should i go on the left side so the cat said well where do you want to go she said oh it doesn't matter she said then it doesn't matter <laughs> if you don't have a goal then you can go any direction you like why why does it matter yeah. so this is the thing that if you don't have any purpose then all types of knowledge are the same so as in contrast to the western theories about knowledge about which i have written a lot in different places uh the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam stated that there are two kinds of knowledge 
One is the knowledge which enters the heart, and that is useful knowledge. And the other is the one which is on tongue, without action on sincerity. The question is, if you look at all of the knowledge that you have acquired, what is that portion of that knowledge that you can put into action, you can use? Is there anything like that? At least when I was in your position, I wouldn't have said that. There is knowledge that I can use to answer questions in the exam. But other than that, in my life, how do I relate to other people? What should I do? Even you will find that if you get a job, you will find that this knowledge that you have learned has no use. If you take the best advanced monetary policy courses here, and then you go to the State Bank of Pakistan to make monetary policy, you will find that nothing that you know has any relationship to what's happening in the So, the sign of useful knowledge is that it enters the heart. So, as I was saying, the knowledge that you have, has it entered your heart? Has it changed your way of thinking, feeling about things? Has it made your heart soft? This is another sign that when Allah Ta'ala enters the heart, the heart becomes soft, it becomes compassionate, merciful, it has love and affection for others. Is it useful to you? Have you ever used that, oh, today I learned this, now this means that I should behave in this way towards my parents, towards my family, towards my brother, towards my sister, towards my neighbors? Has it taught you how to behave? Has it helped you in understanding the world that is around you? We have, every day we hear news that uh, you know Trump is doing this, and Iran is doing this, and Saudi Arabia is acting like this, and China is doing this. Every day there is news about whether CPEC is good for us or bad for us. So, does it help you to understand? Is the knowledge that you have acquired, does it help you to understand anything? Can you solve the problems? Can uh, you have everybody in life has many problems, and uh, we are always approached by people who have problems, and they ask us to help. So, has this knowledge been that you have been taught in the school? Has this been of any help in this? More directly in economics, can you diagnose the economic problems that the country is facing, and can you say what we should do to help? So. <coughs> All of these questions we will try to answer. So now coming to intentions, my goal, first goal. I have many goals and I will not be able to reach all of them. But the first goal is to explain to you that there is such a thing as useful knowledge and there is such a thing as harmful knowledge. And these two things are different. And the useful knowledge goes from heart to heart. It does not go from paper to paper. It is said that the standard model of education is that the teacher takes notes which he never understood and he puts them on the blackboard and the students copy it into their notebooks and reproduce it on their exams and nothing goes through the minds of anybody. So this is not knowledge. This is the imitation of knowledge. So that's why I would like your attention and in particular I would not like you to take notes because the notes prevent the message because I am trying to reach you, I am trying to reach your heart and so you have to open your ears and minds and hearts to be able to understand. If you are writing notes then uh, this will be a barrier, an obstacle and you will not be able to understand and then later on if you read the notes you will not be able to understand either because the message is not inside the words. But uh, the recording is, every lecture is taped, so if anything you miss, you can listen to it again. So, useful knowledge becomes part of you. So, you, when you get it, you understand it, it becomes part of you and you can then use it. Useless knowledge is just useful for filling up notebooks. It's not useful for anything else. It doesn't help you in your life, except that the next student might ask you, okay, give me your notes, I just want to study for the exams. But it's not useful for anything real. Asha, you make a sheet of paper and all the students' names and email addresses. 
दिस इज आवर टी एफ ऑफ दूस क्या नाम है आपका नस्ता आमिर सो वन ऑफ द थिंग्स दैट वी डू इज एक्चुअली अ लॉट ऑफ लर्निंग टेक्स प्लेस आउटसाइड द क्लास सो आई लाइक टू हैव डायरेक्ट कम्युनिकेशन विद द स्टूडेंट्स एंड इफ दे हैव ऑल देयर ईमेल्स देन आई कैन सेंड अ जॉइंट ईमेल टू टेल देम बिकॉज देर इज टू मच मटीरियल दैट आई वुड लाइक टू कवर एंड आई कैनॉट पॉसिबली कवर इट इन द क्लास सो I try to uh, provide some extra material on outside class. So, let us think about the message of Islam. This message changed the history of mankind. If you have read Sayyid Abu Hasan Ali Nadwi has a book which is. called uh, so originally written in arabic and the title is what the world lost by the decline of islam and it has been translated into urdu english and 18 different languages basically he describes that the world was in darkness he did have that there were chinese and romans and egyptians and many other civilizations but they did not have any human values people were the the rich were uh just engaging in luxury and the strong were exploiting the poor and the whole world was a big mess and then the noor of islam came and they taught islam the message of islam had radical things things which nobody ever knew the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that the leader of the people is their servant there's something nobody ever had thought of he said that the response it is the responsibility of the strong to help the poor not to oppress them somebody something new that though those people who are rich should spend their wealth on the ones who are poor and so the first hospitals and post offices and many other types of public services were created by hazrat umar razi allah taala anhu first time in history of mankind and so many all the good ideas that we have today come from islam and everything that appears to be good is so because it is rooted in islam there is a very interesting book just came out called jefferson's quran one of the slave women of jefferson was a muslim and she introduced him to the quran and this had a big impact on jefferson when they were writing the constitution they were if it had not been for the quran they would have written the constitution as a protestant republic like many others but the quran led jefferson to think that no this should be a state in which there is freedom of religion and many other ideas were incorporated this whole book traces how the thinking of jefferson was so there are many good things which america has done and those things come from the message of quran similarly if you trace any good idea you will find that it goes back to the quran so the quran says that allah taala says that i have sent you a messenger who will send you who will convey this message and this will cause you to grow in purity and give you wisdom and teach you that which you did not know so that knowledge that was given to the muslims changed the world and for a thousand years muslim created a civilization which has characteristics which nobody else has been ever able to achieve other historians have written like toynbi and many others that islam achieved equality of different races which no which we have never been able to do in europe even now uh, the culture is extremely racist extremely biased against anybody who doesn't look like them and all over the world and because of this effect uh of the leaders of the world everybody else is also acting in this way including muslims so we don't find the teachings of islam being practiced by muslims today
So, knowledge that was given to the Muslims changed the world. So, the question is, do you have this knowledge? You have the knowledge of how you can change the world. I mean, this is the knowledge that was given to the Muslims. And if we were teaching you this knowledge, then you would have, you would have the ability, the instruments, the methods required to change the world. But all you know is how to get a job. And even that you don't know very well. Only some elements of that. So, what can you bring you peace and contentment into your heart? This is written in the Quran, explained in the Hadith and many other. So, now they offer an option that here it is, you just increase your GNP. If you have more wealth, you will become content. Now, the fact is that if we look for the past hundred years, the income levels have quadrupled in the USA. So has it made them more happy? This question has been explored scientifically by Easterlin, Richard Easterlin, who was on the, actually on my faculty mate. We were teaching at, in UPenn at the same time he was, when he was working on this. So you take many indexes of uh, happiness, suicide rate, polls about how people uh, um, respond to various types of questions which reflect their satisfaction with life and you find that there is no change. So as uh, has been written in the Quran this world is an illusion. Mataul Guru it's a earning of illusion and the Hadith says that if you earn one if a man earns one value of gold and he will want another one. So your happiness does not depend on what you have, it depends on what the difference between what you have and what you want to have. And so there are people who have everything and they want even more and they are very unhappy. So just the, does the pursuit of wealth lead to happiness? There is massive evidence that it does not. Wealth can lead to a short term pleasure but in the long run, happiness, the cause of happiness does not come from external factors. This is the finding of modern psychologists that happiness is something which is inside you. It cannot come from outside. And so no matter what you have on the outside, unless your heart is corrected by tazkiya, by purification, you cannot be happy. So then what is the point of Pursuing. In fact, they looked at people, they have studied people in hospices in all over the world. Now, now there are these places where people go to die because today no longer the family or the community takes care of them. So they have built these institutions where if you are in your last phase of illness, some specialized people take care of you for money because everything is with money these days. The, the, in the economics you will find many articles written which say that what is the benefit of bringing up children. So they count the number of dollars that you invest in the children and then they count the number of dollars that the children give and they say it's useless. We shouldn't have children. <laughs> so um, these hospices where people were dying, they asked people, well, you have lived your life now at the end of your life. What do you think? What are the lessons that you would like to give? So these days, almost universally people say that I spent too much time on the wrong things. I spent time on my job, on making money. I neglected my family, my friends, society. And these are the things that bring pleasure. And if I had the chance to do it again, I would uh, spend less, uh, I would uh, be less concerned about getting a good job and making more money. I would be more concerned about spending more time with my family and having a social life and having friends and enjoying my life is not all about making money but the atmosphere is such that everybody thinks that life is all about making money if you make money it will make you happy even though this is a false god tomorrow you say I have all this money in my bank make me happy the money will not be able to make you happy so this knowledge uh, has not been very useful. So did the modern knowledge, we come to economics, 
economics are supposed to be experts and they are posed as experts. So did, were they able to prevent the global, fin global financial crisis? In the past 30 years, they have been, uh, IMF has documented more than a hundred major monetary and financial crises in the world, which caused lots of damage to lots of people. I mean, the global financial crisis made millions of people unemployed, homeless, hungry. In the USA, the levels of hunger and homelessness were at the same level that they were just before World War. So in the world, on the planet today, we have billions of people who are hungry, who are living on less than one dollar a day. And it is not because of scarcity, as the economists tell you. There is enough food on the planet to feed everybody. More food is wasted, about millions of dollars of food is, is just thrown away. So how come our economists can't tell us how to make, uh, how to feed the people? There is injustice, there is wars, there is oppression, there is exploitation, there is immoral behavior of the extreme degree. So economists have not been able to say anything useful about these things. So is that a useful knowledge that we have? So useful knowledge has the nature that it creates an inner transformation. And this inner transformation inside man leads to an outer transformation inside the world. So Allah Ta'ala says that لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانِ فِي أَحْسِنِ تَقْوِيمِ ثُمَّ رَدَدْنَاهُ أَسْفَلَ سَافِلِينَ So inside man this ayat means that there is the potential to be higher than the angels, the essence, the best. At the same time man has the potential to be the worst than the beasts. So life is about trying to achieve the potential that is buried inside your heart. So the Quran says that are those who know equal with those who do not know? But only men of understanding will understand this. There, so there is a message being given that knowledge is very valuable. If you acquire knowledge, you will become different from the other people. But a very interesting paradox. See, the person who does not know, men of understanding, the person who doesn't understand will not be able to see the difference between the man of knowledge and the man who has no knowledge because they don't have the receptors. Like the blind man cannot see the colors, so the one who does not have knowledge cannot see the difference between the one who has knowledge and therefore he will not understand. So this is the way, yani if you have knowledge, then you have it. If you don't have it, like if I say that, okay, if you learn mathematics, you will be able to do this and that. And if you don't know mathematics, only uh, you can only take my word for it. You cannot understand whether or not it is true. If I say, and, and that's why there is so many hocus pocus. There's book, okay, follow this diet and you will become this. So until you have done it, you don't know. And so it's just the advertisement on which you go. So any, any kind of knowledge you, that you acquire, you don't know whether it's worthwhile uh, until you acquire it and after that it may be too late so it's it's a difficult job to acquire knowledge so but knowledge is very important and valuable Allah Ta'ala says that Allah Ta'ala has uh, to the Prophet that I have given you this Quran and this wisdom and giving me this knowledge and this is a tremendous favor so when so knowledge is a great thing for those who get it And so, in another ayat, Allah Ta'ala says to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Rabbi Zidni Ilma. This is, so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is being asked to pray to Allah for knowledge. So this is, yani, he is the most knowledgeable of all men and he is asked to make knowledge. So this is a model for us that we should also seek knowledge and we should ask Allah for knowledge. So the Prophet ﷺ said that people are like mines of gold and silver. Buried inside you is a great treasure, extremely valuable. But it is buried inside. You have to develop it. You have to mine it in order to get it out. Otherwise, it remains buried. You had this oil sitting in the sands of Arabia for centuries of no value to anybody. Only when you dug it and then 
put in the mines and brought, put the pumps to bring it out and refine it, then it's worth billions and billions of dollars. So the question is, how do we develop this potential which is inside every heart? So, to recap this, there is such a thing as useful knowledge. The Prophet ﷺ made uh, dua for this knowledge and sought protection from harm harmful knowledge. This knowledge changed the lives of the Sahaba and changed the lives of the Badu of the Arabs who were living very primitive conditions and they were very far from civilization in anything. And then this knowledge made them into the leaders of the world. So this knowledge was very valuable. So do we have that kind of knowledge which can change the world, which can change, take a people who are ignorant and backwards and make them into the leaders of the whole world? That is the kind of knowledge that we would like. Now, in your education, you have not been given any knowledge of this kind. In fact, you have given, been fed completely harmful knowledge, that which poisons the heart. And that is why the Prophet ﷺ sought protection from this knowledge. So, just because you might think that Maulana Sahib is giving us a vase, so I am quoting an um, article written by Julie Nelson called Poisoning the Well. She is uh, How Economic Theory Damages the Moral Imagination. It's an article in which she says that human beings have natural inclination to be kind, generous, compassionate, to make sacrifices for others. But economic theory t t teaches us not to do that. It says that rational people, meaning intelligent people, only look out for their own welfare. They don't care about others. So uh, you should be selfish. You should maximize your own utility. You should be indifferent towards others. You see, your utility function says that my utility depends on my consumption. It doesn't depend on your consumption. Whether you eat or not, whether you're hungry or whether... It makes no difference to me. That's what the economic theory teaches you. So, economic theory teaches you very bad lessons which are damaging to your heart. So, the question is that is this uh, suitable for a sermon? We should sit in a masjid and listen to this, but economics is something different. So, to establish that, one twenty note, yes. Now everybody should take out a piece of paper. That's good. Now we are going to play a game. Everybody take out a piece of paper and um, now I want two volunteers. Uh, let's see. Uh, you, you and you. Right, then you just stay where you are. Now, uh, this game is very simple. There are five notes of 20 rupees here. And you are going to be the leader. It's called the dictator game. He is the dictator. He has nothing to do actually. So the game involves splitting this between the two of you. You can, uh, you are the dictator. You get to make the law. You can say that all of it will be mine or some of it will be hers, or all of it will be hers. So now, everybody write down what is the economic theory prediction of what will happen. No, you don't have to. And then write down what you think will happen. How much will he get and how much will she get? And now that we do the actual experiment. This will happen. It's up to you. Oh, yeah. I'm 70. No, I'll give 70. No, you can, uh, it's only 20s. So you can say 60, 40 or 80, 20. No, 80, I'll keep it. <laughs> you keep it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so you get 20 and he gets 80. <coughs> now, what is the prediction of economics? Sit down. Yes. 
We're not going to grade these papers. What does economic theory predict will happen? He will take all the money. Yes, he will take them. Maximize utility. So what did he do? He is irrational. <laughs> now what did you predict? 50-50. Yes, good. These are human beings. He is an economist. <laughs> economist, you see, this is exactly how economic theory corrupts your behavior. It is actually true that Students who have learned economics can sometimes take all hand. Nini, this is yours. Yours. That's yours. You can give it to him. That is his. So, normal students often do 50 50 or 60 40. 80 20 is very rare. This Actually, is. I have been in fight for one year. No? What? I'm you have been in fight for one year. <laughs> I see. So, he has been corrupted by economic theory. This is a demonstration. Actually, this is an unusual split. I mean, uh, this experiment has been done many, many thousands of times all over the world. Less than 10% people split it. And there are uh, about 1% people do take all 100. So the economic theory is right about 1% of the time. And, and it's always the economists who do that. <laughs> uh, but most people give some token amount just to just to preserve their humanity, like he did, you know, give a little bit, <laughs> the smallest amount possible, just to yani, save face that I am also a human being, even though I am an economist. <laughs> but normal people will do a 50-50 split. Uh, actually, that's not the majority, about 30% of the people do 50-50. About 30% more do 60-40 and then 20% do 70-30 and things like that. This is the average behavior of most people. So, but that means that nobody behaves according to economic theory. So, microeconomic theory is a theory about how human beings behave. If people don't act like that, then the theory is false. Now, can a theory give good results if it's false? Well. Actually, Milton Friedman, yani these things were known long time ago that the firms don't behave like they are supposed to, human beings don't maximize and so on. So he said that, no, 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 this is useless. Even if the assumptions are wrong, the theory can be right. This is the famous Friedman as if philosophy, which is completely wrong, but it is, it was developed as a defense of theories which have obviously wrong assumptions. So, <clears throat> Keynes in the early 20th century, when the economic system collapsed and there was this Great Depression, which was completely against what the economic theory said. You see, what happened in the Great Depression was, and again, this is not taught very clearly in economics, because the contradiction between what happened in the Great Depression and what economic theory is teaching you is still true. So they, they tell you a little bit about the Great Depression, but they didn't, they didn't tell you how the Great Depression contradicts the most fundamental principle of economic theory, which is the law of supply and demand. You see, in the Great Depression, what happened was that there was, you know, first of all, the economy was thrown all out of kilter, production became very low, there was a huge amount of unemployment. Now, uh, this unemployment, which occurred in 1929, persisted until the World War II in 1942. So, for about 13, 14 years. Now, according to economic theory, which, which many people said, like Hayek said that it will work, the, if the wages are low, and if, if people don't have jobs, you have excess supply of labor. So what will happen if you have excess supply of labor, the wage will fall and in everybody will find a job except those who don't want to work at that wage. So according to classical economic theory, there is only one type of unemployment and that is called voluntary unemployment. A person doesn't have a job not because he cannot find a job but because the job that he can find pays him too little. He doesn't want to work at the equilibrium wage. Now what Keynes said is that this is not true. There, are, there is a market wage. 
There are lots of people who want to work at that wage or even less than that wage. See, that's the mechanism uh, that if uh, there is a job and it has happened in here, everywhere, we advertise a job, there is one vacancy, 100 people apply. Many of them are willing to work at much less and, and you can say that it's nab qasid so that there's no skill involved. Everybody can do the job. So, you have we have five slots, there are thousand applicants, people like Prime Minister's uh, offices calling that hire this guy, hire this guy. But nobody comes and says that look you are paying um, 10,000 rupees, I will work for 9,000 rupees. Nobody does that. And if they came, we would not accept it. So, uh, you have excess supply of labor, wage does not decline, unemployment doesn't get go away. And basically, all of Keynes book is about explaining how you can have uh, excess supply and this is an equilibrium by itself. So, Keynes wrote that in a, and, and that was a new theory of economics. That's what created macroeconomics, which was the main theory for 50 years. So he wrote that the main problem in arriving at this theory was to escape from the standard economic theory, which was my habit of thinking. The ideas that I am expressing here are very simple and obvious. The difficulty is not in the new ideas that I will try to teach you. The difficulty is in escaping from the old ideas. These old ideas that you have been trained into, the poison that has been fed to you is has caused great damage to both your heart and mind. It has, it has, uh, uh, so the problem is to repair that damage. So you're not starting at zero. If you were starting at zero, we could just throw this economic theory in the garbage and we could start very easily and the ideas that we are going to discuss are not too difficult. But uh, first we have to overcome the fallacy the garbage. So economics is a kind of brainwashing. It makes us believe in outrageous lies. Like the human being, the rational human being will take everything for himself and will not give anything to others. That's so ridiculous. It is not human behavior, it is not good behavior. And we can, and if you think, if you engage your human brain instead of your economist brain, you can understand why this is so. It is not that this is irrational behavior. It is very rational for humans to share with whoever they are with. This is how human beings, if I, am, if I am in need, I can count on the help of others. If they are in need, they can count on my help. If we are all alone, then every problem that I face, I must face all by myself. It's very difficult. But if we are all uh, cooperative and if we all help each other, then anytime I have a problem, I can go to you and anytime you have a problem, you can expect that the community will help you. So it's, it's natural behavior. This is how it should be. So you are taught the behavior which is wrong. And it's, to say that this is rational is also wrong. This is not rational. This is highly stupid kind of behavior. <laughs> so, but economists believe that. This is, this is an outrageous lie. Um, in fact, Amartya Sen wrote an article on this theme called Rational Fools. He says that people who act rationally according to economists are fools. So, because these lies have been taught to us, they make it difficult to see the truth. See, after you have learned economic theory, then you have to think, why should somebody split the money when he can take it all? But if you had not been taught economics, you wouldn't even think like that. You would say that, of course, you should split. Why? You would be surprised. Why would someone think of keeping everything for himself? I mean, you would say, is this really? Yani, is there really a human being who will say that I'll keep everything for myself and not give anything to the other one? That would be very surprising to you. So, the truth is easy to understand. It's self-evident. It shines. It is noor. It enters the heart. Finding the truth is not difficult, but the difficulty lies in cleansing the heart, tazkiyah, purification of the lies and the falsehood. And actually selfishness itself is a, is a big obstacle to understanding the truth because 
it clouds the mind and you see uh, you see there are two things that one is the ability to see what is good for everyone and even if it involves that something which is good for everyone is not good for me like suppose we are ordering some food and the best food is that that would help everybody is haleem although i don't personally like haleem but uh, this is the thing that would serve in the situation so you say okay this is what is good for i would like something else but any my need should not be looked at because we are trying to serve the whole group so that's the natural way of thinking but economics says no everyone is selfish and if something is good for me then i will order it and uh, i will not care what the other people whether they are helped or hurt whether they will like it or they don't like it so that's not natural so i think that uh, that was goal one to explain that there is useful knowledge and useless knowledge and to explain that this is not a vaz or a sermon in the masjid this has application to economic theory and economic theory is act- as it is taught is harmful knowledge but we can change it we can uh, we have the ability to learn the true theories so the second goal in this first lecture is uh, to give you confidence because this is one thing that has been destroyed systematically and deliberately those people who have trained you they don't want you to think about changing the world they are very happy with the world the way it is so they don't want any revolutionaries they don't want people to be changing the system so they have told you that you are nothing you are meaningless you are just one little little person what can you do all alone the whole world is against you uh we are teaching this theory but the ro- opposite theory is being taught in all the universities so what's the use what difference can it make so allah taala says in the quran that who saves the life of one person it is as if he have saved the life of whole of mankind so allah taala says that one life can be worth the equal of all the billions of lives so it is not every single person is as valuable as the whole of the planet so this is a meaningful thing it is not it is not uh, so every person has the potential to change the whole world and it has happened so many times so many people have changed the world so but there is something puzzling here how can one life equal a billion life there is something yani mathematically it doesn't make sense <laughs> one cannot equal a billion so the answer is that it is in terms of potential it is not in actuality if you look at a seed it's very small but it has the potential to become a huge tree which had can contain which can produce billions of other seeds so if you have <coughs> if that potential is realized so in potential this seed is worth billions if it realizes the potential <coughs> otherwise it's worth nothing <coughs> if it doesn't realize the potential so every human being this is what means laqad khalaqna al insana fi ahsan taqwim every human being has infinite amounts of power potential capabilities which are buried inside your heart and we have all the possibility to develop into the tree with the allah taala describes the tree as one which has roots which deep deep into the ground and branches reach high in the skies so we can become like that but it's not that we are like that we, we the, the right applied type of knowledge which is imparted and then applied it has to knowledge has to enter the heart and then it has to translate into actions and deeds then it will transform us and it will change the world <clears throat> so the second goal is that is to believe in yourself is to believe in the possibility that you have the potential to change the world and even though you see this is what i am saying about how the truth reaches the heart because if you look at the facts the data the statistics what you have done from here 
up till now, you will say that there is zero chance of my changing the world because, I mean, if you just look at the past, if you take a fit a regression line to the data of what has been the, your impact on the world, it is nothing, for sure. There is no doubt about it. So, if you just extend the regression line, then there is no possibility of your changing the world. So, but when I say this, because this is the truth from Allah, it touches your heart. You understand that it is true, even though you don't have any evidence for it. Because it's built into your heart, not because I'm saying it. So, uh, this potential, this is very dangerous to the people who are running the world. They don't want you to realize it and they have put all sorts of harmful knowledge and, and wrong things and poisons into your heart to prevent you from realizing that you are unique. There is no one in the, on this planet which has ever been like you. See, Ibrahim is unique. If you look at the billions of people on this planet, there is no one even a little bit like him. That is very strange. Yani, everyone is so completely unique. Even his brother has lived an entirely different life, has had entirely different experiences. Even though they live in the same family, have been exposed. So every two people are just completely different from each other. You can look at their faces and recognize them as different. The experiences that he has, the life that he has led, the potential that he has, nobody else can even imagine what it is. So this uniqueness, this is suppressed. We want to turn you all into standardized parts. This is what the modern knowledge does. But Islam tells you, no, you have something special that only that exists only between you and God. Only God can recognize what you have because if he were to sit down here and tell us the story of his life, <laughs> then all of our life will be spent in that. <laughs> so we don't have time to listen to the story of his life. Only Allah Ta'ala knows every single detail that he has done. And Allah Ta'ala knows what he has designed for his life. And if he can open and understand what Allah Ta'ala wants from him, then he can make progress along that path and he can achieve things and he can bring into being things that nobody can imagine at this point. Because what happens tomorrow, nobody knows. That's what the Quran says, that what will happen tomorrow, nobody knows. So we cannot forecast it by using models and data and empirics. So this message is in your heart, but all of the world conspires to make you believe otherwise. And so the teacher's job is to create that confidence in you, which will, that is what is the, uh, provides you with the energy to make the extraordinary effort that is needed to uh, achieve potential to change the world is not easy. <laughs> you have to work very, very hard, but so where will you get that energy to work very hard? Only if you believe that something can happen. So that belief is the energy which creates the power to, to, to do the struggle that is required. So the third goal in this lecture is that something happened in the globe, globally, for about three centuries, we have been losing all of the battles that we have fought, the Muslims. The, uh, so this breaks the spirit, it says that, okay, we are losers, we cannot win. Edward Said has written this book called Orientalism, which is the other half of the story, I'm talking about the other half. He says that, you know, the West, they conquered the world in about, in uh, early 20th century, 1900, uh, the Europe had control, Europe or European colonies had control over uh, about 85% of the land mass of the planet. Only 15% was free. So basically, he says that all of the European literature, all of their science, all of their, is influenced by this conquest, that this conquest led them to believe that they are superior. And this message, 
that the we, the whites, are superior to the others, the blacks, is everywhere in the. It's a. It's implicit. It's explicit. Sometimes it's explicitly written. Sometimes it's implicit. But this message permeates the whole whole uh, body of knowledge produced by the West. Correspondingly, we have the reverse message that yes, we are inferior. Some people have expressed it very clearly. Like Sir Sadi Ahmed Khan said that the Europeans are so far above us that we are like animals. If they cut us, that is their privilege and right. The um, British have said the same thing that the blacks are so inferior to the human uh, to uh, to us whites that they don't count as human beings. And similarly, the Aboriginal people of the Australia they were hunted like animals. And similarly, the British in many different ways have said that the people in India they are not fully human. They are, they have some understanding and. They are partially humans, but they're not in they are not at the same level of civilization. They have weak minds and so on. So we have also been influenced by this. When I went to the MIT, I was worried that will I be able to compete. So far, I have been. So I found that uh, there um, in the USA generally. If there are too many foreign students in a class, the Americans drop the class because, you see, the best foreign students are going to the America and the, uh, the curve is such that the, and if you can't compete with the best, then you get lower grades. So, psychologically, we suffer from an inferiority complex. Uh, some time ago, there was, they have, there are lots of bad things that are happening. There was some child who was beaten up and to death. So one of the newspaper uh, uh, columnists wrote that we are a nation of cockroaches. We watched this child being killed and nobody did anything. Now the fact is that in the USA uh, somebody got up and took a gun and killed uh, lots of children in school and many, I mean, 300 such events took place in 2016. But nobody said that we are a nation of cockroaches. So this is just a sign of the inferiority complex. The Germans uh, did massive amount of cruelty to the Jews. Uh, they, they burned uh, alive women, children, uh, families in, in, five, in ovens designed for this purpose. But they didn't say that we are a nation of cockroaches. So this inferiority complex in our mind, this tells us that, no, we can never achieve. For 300 years we haven't achieved anything. How can we achieve anything? So this is another obstacle to uh, making progress. So uh, how can we possibly, any, the West is so far ahead of us. How can we possibly, even any, many people say that we are not entitled to criticize their theories. We don't have the uh, standing that they are human beings. They are far above us. Whatever they say, we should say, Amanna Saddakhna. We are not authorized. I mean, if, we were, if we are at the same level, then we can, we can talk about them and we criticize them. But we are so far benign that we just follow whatever they say. And when we catch up, then we can say something. So actually, you have been taught theories which are laughable. You see, suppose that I were to tell you, forget about economics, forget about my lecture for the moment. Just if I, I say that, Look at this old lady who is buying onions or buying tomatoes. You know what she is doing? She has this multivariable function, you call it utility function. And now she is taking the first partial derivative of all of these. And she is making uh, n by n simultaneous equation. Now she is substituting the budget constraint. And now she has calculated that uh, she should buy two and a half pounds of tomatoes. See, that's what she is doing. So everybody is smiling. Why, why are you smiling? When it was told to you by Samuel and she said, yes, of course, you were very serious. Yes, yeah, I have to learn this. This is what she is doing. How ridiculous. So, we close our eyes to our experience. I am a shopper. You are a shopper. You have all purchased. We know that 
there is no budget constraint and there is no utility maximization. We buy things because I have to go and uh, Ami says, Ke, bring me one pound of tomatoes and one pound of... Uh, we don't even ask the how much it costs. We just say, okay, this is what I need. Where is this budget constraint? Where is this? And we don't uh, maximize utility. We know that this grocer has the... He sells more expensive onions. He sells them for... Uh, 50 rupees is here and a little bit down there is a big guy and he's selling a 40 but we say okay why bother I'll buy from here everything so our own experience personal our history our um, observations all of this we put into a book no Sam Wilson said this it must be right he is Nobel Prize winner who am I to question so Blind faith we have in the knowledge of the West. So, now the third goal in this lecture is to teach you some new ways of thinking which we have not been taught. And this is called meta theory. So, there is theory which is uh, which you know you have studied economic theory. Meta theory is a theory about theories. So it's at a higher level. So we are it's an external view of economic theory. What is economic theory? Who believes it? Why do they believe it? How does it change? How does it function? This is a very different way of thinking. You can it's easy to understand from a different perspective. Let's say that we take Islam. Now there is Islam, the teaching of Islam as a Muslim. So I understand, okay, these are the orders of Allah and this is what you should do. And then they, you can study Islam as an outsider that, okay, this is what Muslims believe, this is how they act, this is what they do. So, this is, uh, we are going, we want to study economic theory as an outsider from an external perspective. That this is what certain people have said, this is what their theory is. Uh, how is it, how is theory used? What is this used for? How does it act? Who does it help? Who does it hurt? How does the economic theory change? It keeps changing all the time. So what are the causes of change? These are the external questions. Now, uh, there is a big difference between the external view and the internal view. In the internal view, which is the standard view, which is what you have been taught, which is what you have been taught how to think, economic theory is true. So once it's true, then you don't have to ask these meta questions. You see, if you are a Muslim, and if you say about Islam that this is the true religion, then studying Islam is sort of a useless kind of activity. That I mean, Islam is true. If you believe in God, you will get to heaven. And so to start studying that these are Muslims and this is what they do and that is what this is sort of nonsense. I mean, if you miss going to heaven, then <laughs> you've lost everything. So you better start acting like a Muslim. So now, the way that you have been taught economics is that this religion by the way, there is a book called Economics as a Religion by Nelson, not Julie Nelson, another Nelson. So, you have been taught that economics is true, so you should learn it and you should practice it. I mean, this is how things are, this is how consumers behave, this is how firms behave, this is the marginal cost function. So, uh, then the, all the, with this, uh, this, is, this is the simplest meta theory about theories. The, the theory about theory. One theory is what I am going to try to teach you, which is that it is not true, but people still believe it. So why do people believe something which, when it is not true, then there is a, uh, you have to ask, okay, what, what are the kinds of arguments that were used to convince people? Like I have told you, you have been convinced of Sam Wilson, even though it is false, because you believe in his authority. So you believe that... Uh, uh, you believe in the dominance of the West, so you say if the theory is coming from the West, it must be true. So this is an external, as opposed to you, you believe this theory because it is true. If it is true, then it's sensible for you to believe it. <coughs> so the simplest theory which you have been taught to believe is that economic theory is true. We learn it because it gives us knowledge about the real world and by making policies using this theory, we can get good outcomes. But if you, instead of looking at the books, you raise your word and look at the world around you, do economists have knowledge of the real world? Uh, <coughs> in the 1990s, the World Bank 
created the Washington Consensus. This was a set of policies, and they said that all the nations should follow these policies. There were ten policies, and then they will all become developed. So in 2003, they wrote a book reviewing the 1990s and saying that, sorry, the policies we said didn't work. Many say many of the nations, of more than 50 nations, they tried these policies and they didn't become developed. They didn't become rich. So. Uh, and the book said that actually in light of this failure we have to say we don't really know what works and what doesn't work. So they don't have knowledge. Uh, there have been so many crises, economists are, everybody has a different opinion, nobody knows what to do, nobody, nobody actually foresaw the global financial crisis. Even the Queen of England, she went to London School of Economics and she said, how come nobody saw it coming? And he, even Queen of England doesn't know much economics, but she said, at least you should, guys should have warned us, you are the ones who are doing economics. And the US Congress, it set up a committee to investigate the failure of economics to predict the global financial crisis. So economists can't even do such uh, simple things like predict the crisis or, as uh, other people have said, fix the problem after it has been occurred. They didn't, they were not able to uh, to, pre uh, to, to prevent the great recession which followed, even though it could have been done if they had the right knowledge. But they, because economic theory is wrong, it, it, uh, it suggests misleading and wrong solutions. The solutions are there, it's not that the, there is a true theory, but the economics that you are taught does not have that. Just like yani, about human behavior, we have, we know a lot about human behavior. You personally know more about human behavior than the economist. Actually, I've written an article in which I explain that, that here is a game, here's what the economic theory predicts, here's what, just take a normal person and ask him what will happen. The normal person will come to a better, uh, uh, will, will predict what happens better than the economist. The most famous example of this is the prisoner's dilemma game which you might have seen, that basically the, the person gets uh, more individual benefit by betraying the other person. Uh, and according to economic theory, the dominant strategy for both players is to betray. But when you have real people play the game, they both cooperate, even though they are complete strangers and they don't know that they can trust each other. So economic theory, economists predict that they will betray each other, Normal people say that they will cooperate, normal people are right, economists are wrong. So economic theory is just false. So where can I find your that uh, article? It's called Empirical Evidence Against Utility Ma Maximization. So, uh, a survey of the literature. So is economic theory true? This is the simplest meta theory, the what you have been taught to believe. Of course, I'm saying it, but uh, I would like you to reflect on the world around you and tell me, what do you think? The, do the firms maximize profits? Do the individuals uh, uh, maximize utility? Is there a supply function? Is there a demand function? Is there equilibrium? Have you read Varian? That's, I assigned that for this next lecture on the first chapter is on supply and demand. So he sets up this model of supply and demand where there are students, they're looking for housing in the um, nearby area. So basically what he says is that, okay, let's assume that the houses are all alike. So in equilibrium, the prices will be all the same. So is it true that the students are living in um, places where are all the hostel rooms priced at exactly the same price? Uh, so where is this equilibrium price? What is the equilibrium price? There is a huge amount of evidence that economic theory is not true. So then the next question arises that if it's not true then is it useful? So th in that case you have to say okay here is the theory, here is the reality. Let's look at the match. Is it a close match or is it a 
bad match now uh, if you you have read a lot of economics so far I come to come to my amphil did you ever find any in your books about any discussion of what real firms do there is none why because if you if the studies have been made of what real firms do and these studies don't have any match to the theory so if either you got to teach the theory or you study what real firms do you can't teach both because they are in contradiction with each other and actually that's why friedman invented this as if methodology he said that even when the when we ask the firms and the firms manager says that we don't profit maximize this doesn't mean that they don't profit maximize our theory takes precedence over facts and observations so now why is there so much what i'm trying to tell you is that nearly everything that is being said in the newspapers nearly everything that people believe nearly all of the knowledge that we have is just false so why is this so this to, uh, for this there is this very famous ancient parable about this king who had a beautiful daughter and one of the lowly um, people in his society of low rank uh, managed to fall in love with his the princess so the king was very angry and he wanted to kill that guy but the commoner but the princess loved that man so she said no no don't kill him so the king found a very brilliant method of getting rid of that man he took one of the courtiers one of the maids of the queen and he put two doors in front of this man in behind one door there was a hungry tiger who was wild and and uh, in behind the other door was this uh, maid servant of the queen and he said okay so i will spare your life if you choose the right door if you choose the door with the lady behind it then you will get married to her and you will survive if you choose the door with the tiger you will be killed by the tiger either way you are out of the picture for my daughter so uh, so um the princess when he was choosing the doors and his thinking it's life and death decision so the princess signals to him to choose the right door <laughs> but now the question is should he trust the signal <laughs> now he had another friend at the court the friend was actually in love with this maid also and he knows that from the beginning so the uh, this person also signals choose that door <laughs> so now the question is should he trust so the point of this story is so he opened the right door and what happened to him this is the question we don't know the answer to so the point is that every person who is writing history or developing theories is doing so because he has he has some interest there is no no unbiased parties if there was a neutral and unbiased party then they wouldn't work they wouldn't uh, write about it it's not and if i don't have any interest in something then i will not write about it i have many things that better things to do so everyone is an interested party every party is an interested party so then finding the truth is not easy at all because so the economists are not uh, are not neutral third parties they have a lot to gain and a lot to lose depending on whether their theories are believed or not and there are also other parties there there are lots of powerful groups in this game who are uh, manipulating the world to their advantage and so power does not work this is a very important insight of michel foucault a philosopher of the 20th century that power does not work by swords and by guns the most important type of power is soft power power in which i convince you that to be a slave is the best thing for you to be a laborer this is what karl marx said that capitalism doesn't work by forcing the laborers to work it works by making the laborer believe that this is the only possible system 
Margaret Thatcher said that there is no alternative. This is the only system, it is the best possible, there is no alternative. So this is a very important, there is no alternative, Tina. This, as long as you believe that there is no alternative, then you will do whatever you have to do. But if you believe there is an alternative, you will become a revolutionary. That's one something we don't want. So all accounts are biased. If you look at conventional economic theory, I have a small article that this should be called economic theory of the top 1%. Because everything in this theory is designed to favor the 1%. You see, this theory is developed for the reason of de uh, protecting the interest of the 1% against the bottom 90%. Why? Well, I could give examples. I have written an article which I explained how every single concept that you study is designed to conceal the advantage that the 1% have. So take, for example, the most common one, the one which is, more, which is called GNP per capita. What is GNP per capita? GNP per capita is you take all of the wealth produced in the nation and you divide it equally to, to everybody in that whole nation. And that is the measure. Now, the wealth is not actually divided equally <laughs> among all people. If we, instead of GNP per capita, we were to take just five measures. Take the amount of wealth which the top 20% have, take the amount of wealth in the middle 20 percentile and take the bottom 20 percentile. And let's say th these are the five GNPs. Our nation doesn't have GNP per capita. Our nation has five GNPs. The top 20 percent have this much. So these five numbers, these are, this is the picture. If you take this as a picture, then you will find that the result is horrifying. And if yani, the minister of finance were to say that, look, we have made a lot of progress because the top class has doubled its income and the bottom class has gone down, people would say, no, you are wrong, this is not right. So, GNP per capita, it highs, it, it adds all of these things up and divides by five and you are done. You cannot see what the top one percent are getting. So, this is a deception. Many other things like that. So, there was a battle in the 20th century when the Great Depression occurred, then the fraud that is economic theory became clear to everybody. And Keynes was the most important one of them. And so, <coughs> uh, in the general theory he explained how supply and demand does not work in the labor market. This point is never made clear to the students who are even who are studying Keynes today that what Keynes is saying is that supply and demand doesn't work. Once you say that supply and demand doesn't work in the labor market, then you ask why should it work in other markets? <coughs> and there is lots of literature about that. So for a while, for about 50 years from 1930 to 1980, there was a remarkable change in the income distribution. The top 1% share of income became low. From 1930 to 1980, it declines. Uh, they are both the same around 1929. Uh, the top 1% has 50% uh, of the money and nine, bottom 90% has the remaining 50% with the middle 9% having a little bit. Now, uh, from 1930 to 1980, the top 1% keeps going down and the bottom 90% keeps going up because the Keynesian theories and the Great Depression <coughs> drove out the classical theory. But then this, uh, the top 1% did not like this and they started preparing a counter-revolution. From the 50s, 60s they started working and finally in the 1980s they managed to launch the counter-revolution. This was called the Reagan-Thatcher era in which Keynesian theories were rejected, Keynesian ideas were stopped and financial deregulation took place which was exactly uh, financial regulation was basically the banks and the financiers their power was contained after the Great Depression because they had caused a lot of damage so lots of rules were put into place. 
to tie up and chain these capitalists. These uh, ties and chains were dropped. Uh, there was one very important act, slowly and gradually, one very important act was the Glass-Steagall Act, which said that the uh, banks cannot speculate, cannot buy stocks, cannot do any kind of gambling. In 1999, that act was repealed. And in 2007, you had the global financial crisis. It didn't take very long because the banks did exactly what they do. You see, what happens is that the banks gamble with other people's money. Because it's not none of it is theirs. So if they make 10 to 1 grains, they can pocket, they only have to pay 5%, they can pocket 90%. If they lose everything, it's not their loss. The funds are insured by the government. Even if they're not insured, the government refunds. So it's, in, it's all their incentive to gamble with other people's money because they don't get to pay for their losses and they, 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 uh, they uh, get, get all of the gains. So after the 1980s, the curve starts changing. Now the top 90% keeps coming down and the bottom 1% keeps coming up until around, um, basically around the global financial crisis, they became equal. And now actually the top 1% has more than the bottom 90%. So um, economic theory is not, as you have been taught to believe, the truth. Economic theory is a battleground. So what we are talking about is called the analysis of discourse. Why do people yani, talk? Uh, discourse is just talk, a fancy name for talk. But uh, so if we are going to study talk, so why do certain economists say certain things and why do other economists say other things? So one example of the, this battle which continues every day, this was the Nobel Prize that was given to Fama and Schiller. Schiller was at UPenn with me, Fama was at Chicago. Now after the crash, now uh, the thing is this is like giving the Nobel Prize to one person who believes in X and the other person who believes in not X. These are opposites. These are two opposite people. Fama says that there is no such thing as a, a stock market bubble. Uh, he says he believes in rational expectations. So if the price is very high, it is rational that it should be high. There is a reason for it to be high. It cannot, stock prices are never irrational. Schiller, on the other hand, was a behavioral economist. He says that no people, uh, he, has, he has written a book called uh, Irrational Exuberance. So these are, yani, he says it's irrational, he says they're irrational. To give them both a Nobel Prize makes no sense because both of these theories cannot be wrong at this, cannot be right at the same time. <coughs> so there is another story about why this happened. But basically what I'm trying to say is that in economics we have uh, always had and continue to have two opposite points of view, both being held as true. And so uh, the, the elementary approach, the one you have been taught is to say that, okay, we find out which one is true and then we believe in that. But actually the meta theory is, is uh, uh, the discourse theory is higher level than that. He said that nothing is true. Neither this theory is true. These two are opposed to each other. Now the question is which theory is, yani, which theory serves the interest of which group? What are they doing to, uh, to popularize it? Which theory serves the interest of the other group? And wha who believes in it? Who does not believe in it? And so on. So this is at a higher level. So we are not looking at the theories as being true and false. We are just looking at the theories as part of a game which is being played by different groups as um, because everybody wants their own uh, interest to prevail. So in protecting their interests, they are creating theories which, which justify those interests because the real power is the soft power, the power of knowledge. And the power of guns is not uh, as strong as the power of the theories behind the guns. So we're coming to the end of this lecture. Next time, 
I will cover the standard theory of the firm, <coughs> which is about eight pages in chapter one of Varian Intermediate Microeconomics. I have a website on which I have attached this uh, particular eight pages. And then we will develop a critique. We will explain why this theory is completely wrong, completely bogus. Uh, the key elements is that the equilibrium price emerges from the uh, supply and demand and that in competitive equilibrium you get price equals m marginal cost. So I assume that everybody has seen these before but we will go over these once again just to make sure that you understand the basic theory. But also there is another way. I mean, we are going over this from an external point of view. What is this theory trying to do instead of trying to learn what the theory is? So from an external point of view, things look quite different. Uh, we will show that this idea that price should be equal to marginal cost is just a mathematical mistake. It doesn't work like that. There is a derivative that is ignored. And uh, they say that it is ignored. They say that in the small firm, will not take into account the um, fact that as the output expands, the price will go down because it is too small. Now this is a, a word that you say, but when you do the math, you find that it is not true. You find that, you see, if I say, look, the probability of my uh, mobile uh, running, uh, any, uh, uh, coming, a uh, phone call coming in is very low. And that's true. So in the masjid, I don't turn it off. So now there are a thousand people in the masjid. What's the probability that someone will phone will ring? It's very, very high. So just like that, even though for a single firm, the term is small, when you look at the industry, which consists of thousands of firms, the, uh, these small firms add up to something very big. And it makes a com uh, complete difference. So this idea that you can ignore something for the firm and then you can ignore something for the industry, this is completely wrong. It doesn't work like that and you, you can prove it. What? This is not the... Yes, this is it. So this is the basic website for the course. It's called sites.google.com slash site slash az for math. Az for math. Uh, this is advanced microeconomics. The main textbook for the course is uh, Hill Myatt, the economics anti-textbook, which is available from download from, from this first page. Uh, so this AM00 is the, there are lots of other materials because I use this website for the lectures for advanced microeconomics 2, which I taught last term. Some of the material is relevant. For the moment, um, I will not mention it. Uh, so, but the pages relevant to this are going to be marked as AM. So AM00 is the home page. AM01 is the intro, which is what we have covered today. And, uh, this is the first lecture. The slides for the lecture are over here. Uh, some relevant materials is posted here. Yani, uh, links to some posts which are relevant to the material in this. Uh, and on the home page also, you are asked to do two things. There is a Google group called the AZ Research Group. I would like you all to join that group because it will give you access to uh, some of the material we use are copyrighted. So uh, if you join that group, you can get that material. Uh, there's also a Facebook group. group. I don't like that group uh, because Facebook leads to a huge amount of waste of time for many people. But I found that many people are um, joining that group. So I have used it last uh, semester for that uh, course and so may I'll post to it from time to time but that's not going to be my main uh, method for communicating communicating with the students uh, main method will be the email list which will be 
uh, collected by the TA. And uh, yes, I want you to not just have the handwritten form, but actually, if you give it to your mobile, I want you to type it up as a list of emails so that I can send it to all of them. So in that, I will give you relevant material for the course.